Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I want to thank everybody for being here this evening. Uh, regards of the numbers, uh, we did have a great conversation and discussion around EMOC and more importantly, men of color, men of color, and how we look at our refugee and immigrant communities. Uh, my name is Gabriel Bryant. Uh, I'm the coordinator for the EMOC initiative, which means engaging men of color. Uh, this initiative is designed to promote mental wellness for men and women of color. And for us, that means access to services, uh, being able to know where the services are in the communities, uh, but most importantly, reducing stigma right, around uh, attaining mental health for oneself. This initiative um, is a part of DBHIDS, the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. And um, I want to acknowledge, first of all, people who can't be here this evening, but since uh, they are welcome as well. Our commissioner, uh, David Jones, as well as our deputy, com deputy commissioner, uh, Roland Lamb. Again, they come here today, uh, but we're thankful for this event happening this evening and to be with you all today here at Only High School. We also want to thank uh, Jamie Brunson, the professor of arts, who also couldn't be here today, but is somebody who's definitely been pivotal uh, to our work here at DBHIDS, and certainly to EMOC, uh, certainly the first person arts team, Dan, Jen, Tanisha, uh, Danielle, for just the, their diligence. We want to thank uh, Diana Diaz uh, from here at Only High School for being such a gracious host. And if I could, if, if you're part of the EMOC uh, committee or EMOC uh, planning team or EMOC, please stick a planning team. Can you please stand up, please, so you can be recognized? These folks um, really make this happen, and they really uh, uh, have supported me um, in phenomenal ways, and the department also in phenomenal ways. Um, this initiative, Beyond Dictations, is an initiative designed to help us promote mental wellness by using compelling stories that we feel can kind of gather us and, and see how we can all see ourselves in the stories here on stage tonight. Um, it's important to have a safe space that's nurturing, um, and that will be an environment for us all to kind of learn, to be inspired, to share, and at the closing of this, we'll actually have a talk back. We'll, we'll be able to provide some more commentary about today's stories. In the past, we focused on uh, Latino men and African American men and uh, men and boys from the LGBTQIA communities. Um, but tonight is, is very interesting and important because oftentimes uh, some of our, of our most marginalized folks in the city are those who are identified as refugee or as immigrant. We know that there are, are, are several issues uh, that compound uh, these communities and those identities. And it's important to learn from them, to share from them, and to also understand how their stories actually connect to our stories as well. We also want to thank uh, the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations, as well as the Welcoming Center for New Pennsylvanians for providing some information which you can find actually out front, as well as if you have any issues today around mental health, we also have the health reading, it's anonymous, that you can also attain as well out uh, front in the lobby. We also have, are gonna have a survey at the closing of the program. Um, if you can, please complete the survey. The survey allows us to be more informed on the data and how to best provide services uh, for this community. So we'll be giving that out at the close of the performance. And lastly, uh, we hope that you guys will join us. We have our next two final ones for this uh, spring. Uh, June 7th, we're going to be actually focusing on men of color who are in recovery, all right? So if you're talking about recovery, we're talking about men of color who might be dealing with addiction issues, uh, men of color who are dealing with perhaps domestic violence issues, the traumas from incarceration, and really all the full breadth of what uh, recovery you know, really means. That will be June 7th in the evening, 6.30 p.m., and it will be held at the Yesha Hall in South Philadelphia, 23rd Snyder. And then on June 21st, uh, we're focusing on men and the opioid epidemic. Um, obviously, we know that that epidemic has really uh, taken a hold of the news cycle, and it's you know, and everybody's tongue and mouths as we discuss this challenge in our community and really in our city. And so, we're going to look at the opioid epidemic and the men and boys who are dealing with that story and dealing with that issue and dealing with those concerns. That will be again on Thursday, June 21st. It'll be held at Congreso. Uh, right off, off of American Street, and again, once again, at 6.30 p.m. So join us there for that. Uh, an important note, uh, the restrooms will be right outside uh, in the lobby area, I'll find them there. And please, if you can, no uh, camera flashing, because sometimes that can distract our store uh, today. 
If you could also please turn your cell phones on silent. Um, so I know many of us didn't have ringtones. Um, so if you can, please turn your cell phones on vibrate or silent even better. That'd be fantastic. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, hope you guys enjoy this evening. It's gonna be a great, great story to, uh, time to kind of figure out how we can support our men and boys. And that being said, I wanna bring up our first uh, guest, hey, to the stage, y'all. Good, good for me, y'all. Hi, um, <laughs> well, thanks for coming, and my name is um, Won Hai, and you can call me Hai. I'm 16 years old, and I'm from Cambodia. Um, I have a sister and a brother, and I grew up, like I said, in Cambodia. Um, back home, I grew up with my grandmother, because, um, my, because my relationship between my mother and my father, they was divorced and left me with my grandmother when I was nine months. And back home, I have an amazing life. I have friends, I have school, I have a um, you know, relationship with everyone in the community I was living in. And about a while after my mom left me, when I was like 10, um, 10 or 11 years old, my mom said that, I heard that my mom put on paper and tried to get me uh, to live there with her. She was trying to sponsor me there. And I was excited to live in a new life and new countries, a new experience. And after a while, the paper um, was ready for me and my sister to go there. It take a long while. When I got there, I, I know that I have to go. The feeling that I have to go is different when I first heard that I have to go. The, I, when I heard it, I was excited. But when I have to really have to go, I was all mixed of emotion. I was excited for the new things. I am emotional for living everything that I was building my whole life in my home, my grandma, who basically my mom, back home, leave, leave that behind. Um, so I flew from Cambodia to land on um, New York and the first time, the first thing that I noticed when I walk up the plane is the weather. It's cold, back, back home was warm and nice. And it got me a bit chilly feeling that things may not be planned as I've been expecting it to be. Um, after that, I, you know, well, um, brought, rode a bike or bus to Philadelphia, which I'm living in now with my mom. Um, here is a bit strange because I have to build a relationship with my mom and my stepdad. My mom basically just like stranger because I never met her before. And school's also hard because of my English and everything is strange and scary for me. I spent my first year, my first freshman year here, locked myself in my home, I call it cave. Um, I just couldn't get myself to go out because it was so scary out there and the idea of getting out is freaked me out. On the summer, I decided that I tell myself that I can't do this forever, I can't lock myself inside this cave forever. My mom can do it. She came here with my stepdad. They both don't know any English and they can build a business and can bring me and my sister here. So why can't I just go out and live my life? Because this is my new home. And I like it or not, I have to live the best of it. So I courage, collect all my braveness and courage to go out. And the first thing, that when I go out, when I went out, I planned to go to the city hall because that's what my teacher was recommended when I told them that I never went outside. And in order to get to the city hall, I have to take a bus. So, like I mentioned, I live in a cave and I don't know anything. It's included how to take a bus. I went to the bus stop and wait at the back of the line so that I can observe what people do so I can learn. I saw a lady put a coin in a machine it was a token, but I don't know what it is. So I put up a 25 cents coin, and I drop it in the machine. And the bus driver called me out in front of everybody. He may or may not purposely did that, but he said 
What country are you from? Did they teach you how to write bus for 25 cents? And I was embarrassed, I was hurt, and mostly I was scared. Not because it's called me a scammer, but the fact that there's people out there like him. I could meet them everywhere, every corner of my life living here now. That scared me more because my first day, you know, being not the way I'm planning it. I mean, who put a token? And after that, it gave me the chill feeling that this is the life I'm living in now. After a while, I met a lady. I was on my bike to my riding class on a sidewalk. And I didn't know that it was illegal or it was not right to ride on a sidewalk because back home we don't have a sidewalk. And I rode I past a lady and a lady said to herself under her breath that she, I hear it, I heard it. She said, read my country's law. And why am I telling, telling you these two stories? What are they related or what does it have anything to do with immigrants? They both had one thing in common. One thing in common is that they said it in a disgusted tone. And that tone made me feel disgusted. Not to them, not to the bus driver, not to the lady. But that made me disgusted myself that I, to be even here for another minute. Because I don't, did not feel welcome here. That everyone is not accepting me. And that hit me because I live, I'm lucky enough to live in part of the country where most people, a lot of people, accepting us and welcome us. What about all the people, what about all the immigrants like us and refugees who live in a part of the country that they don't be, be accepted? They go to school where they can't make friends because friends think them as savages. Because that could happen, everyone here, there's a possibility there are people out there not lucky enough like me to meet a few people, like the lady and the bus driver. And am I asking too much for everyone, 100% of people accepting us? Maybe. But what I'm thinking is that I want them, I want to ask them to follow our footsteps, to hear our voices, and follow, our, follow us back to know what we really are, to know what we really am. We are not what they've been here by um, some people who don't know us and think us of, think, thinking of us some way that's not true. And when they, when, uh, if they do that, they will know that we are not here just to be on a bad purpose. We're here for opportunities. We're here for a better life. We're here for freedom because it was written on the name of America for freedom, the country of freedom. And we are mm, human beings. We, some people have a lot of, in, in their play, they have family to support. They have um, family situation, many situations that they won't even understand. So I want them to be nice to us, to accept, to be accepting us, because we are human beings, we have feeling, and we have a lot in our place to be accepted. One thing that I want you to remember, is that, and I'm still learning it, I learned as, till now that the less number of people who are trying to hurt us doesn't make it any less painful when they do. So please, accepting us, be nice to us, and supporting us to be here. Thanks. Liberia, West Africa. I'm speaking about immigration, how I migrated from Liberia to different countries onto 
United States of America. First of all, I used to work with uh, the president of Liberia, Isamado, and the Minister of State for Presidential Affairs. Well, I realized that after the coup, killing Turbo, they took over Liberia. And after that, the country became bankrupt. I thought wise to go further my education in a different country. So because I have a background of Islamic, the government sent me to Egypt to study Arabic in order to work in a foreign field. I was fortunate. I migrated also to Syria to learn very fast. I went to Damascus University where I attended two years college to know my language, Arabic. I came back to Egypt. There I got the opportunity to work in the embassy as a translator to the ambassador. But I realized I said, ah, during that period we have uh, a Liberia civil war, which really captured Liberia and went as far as Sierra Leone, the neighboring countries. And in this world, uh, most of my family members, as well as our police and youths, were victimized. What they used to do is to give them drugs, 15, 12 years old children, give them drugs uh, to go fight in the war front. As a result, if you give drugs to somebody, I think the brain becomes different. Addicted, some of them taking the drug become addicted. They start killing their brothers, their fathers, their mom, etc., etc. Hey, this, I look at this long time and say, oh, this is very, very uh, dangerous in our country. So I worked in embassy for at least a year or two. I said, well, I want to migrate to America where I've discovered they have opportunities. I came to America really as an army immigrant to gain the opportunity to help our people back home and those also, they, they, they have also got the opportunity to come to this country and youth, they deviated what they're supposed to do which is education or to better themselves. They joined to the drug addiction. I became mad. I said, what? Africa, you come to this country, you get a big opportunity, four opportunity here. If you want money, you want education, you want everything, you can get it here. You come jump on the street with this uh, drug addiction. I went to school. Uh, the first I did my BSc in the business, and I got a job as accountant. Oh, this never pleased me. I said, well, I'm still sorry. In a sympathetic feeling with these people, I can't work in this field. I went to school to do my mental health counseling. And the first job I got, uh, I worked with a CCTC, Children Crisis Treatment Center, to help the children from this, from, from this uh, addi addi addition. So they trained us. Different way, even though there are some challenges to work in this field, because you're working with somebody, he has a mind focusing different way on you working with somebody. They taught us to work with these people. And because of sympathetic feeling, I really kept calm to work with these people. And I was fortunate to meet up with my friend, my brother, Mr. Lanfia Morate, who was a BSc on top of me, give me the zeal, uh, the courage. To work with these people because sometimes working with somebody, he doesn't even know what he's doing. And in this field, you work with different field people like uh, ADHD and body to combine, autism, all the work with these people. So I used to sorry for them. I said, How can I help these people? So I started working with them, sending them to different schools. Some of them abused us, called all, all different names. We all are assets, you know, some of them fight with us. No, if you find one, but they taught us how we can, you know, blast everything like that. This, uh, this has, has escalation, when it comes to that point, where you have, how you can, you know, save yourself, save your life. They taught us all it is. So we started helping these people, most of them, they gained their normal 
life. Some of them they don't because if you are addicted and helping somebody at the same time go home to take the drug at the same time, working with other people, you know, it was very too, too, too much, too numerous. So I started thinking to help my people, you know, people these people to go back home to help the community, uh, Liberia, so that we can be in a better, 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 better society. In South West Philly, we have more people there who are taking this drug and some of them they started deporting them. They put it back to Africa. Some of them they don't have use for themselves. I was sorry for the people, the way I see our friends really suffering from this addiction. And some of this drug is bad, they say cocaine. I never knew about cocaine before. Cocaine, heroin, all kinds of drugs. I, I, start, I started learning the names. It's an, a big opportunity I can afford in, like in America here to give me my, 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 I'm really happy to be among you people today and I'm happy to help my people if you, you can help them to, to, to gain their normal life to go back to Africa or their community in Southwest Philly to help them to gain their normal, normal life so that I can satisfy the community. Thank you very much. Halfway decent. Um, my name is Nuba St. Louis, and I'm here today to share my uh, immigrant story. Uh, my immigrant story is slightly different than most immigrants, because we generally have a sense in terms of immigrants being born in a different country and migrating here. Um, in my case, I was actually born here in the United States, and shortly thereafter, uh, my parents moved back to Haiti. So I'm what many people may call an anchorman. I was born here, and I moved back to where my parents come from. So I spent the better part of my childhood in Haiti. Um, spent some of my summers here in the United States, going back and forth. Um, but at the age of 12 years old, we moved back to the United States. And I have been a happy, a happy child, well-rounded, um, enjoyed talking to my friends, engaging, outgoing, and what have you. But I really struggled to adjust upon my return to live in the United States. I struggled to make friends, I wasn't accepted, I was bullied, I was marginalized, in large part because I spoke with an accent. But I want to put this in context. We're talking about the early 1990s. This is at the, after the heel of the AIDS epidemic. And during the AIDS epidemic, there was a big struggle. Scientists and the CDC couldn't necessarily explain where the AIDS epidemic came from. And it was rumored that AIDS was a byproduct of Haitians. So I was called all types of names and was ridiculed. And my grades suffered. My self-esteem suffered. I mean, being here talking publicly is something I could never imagine doing. That's how much I was afraid to sort of like speak publicly. And my self-esteem took a major hit. Um, being called all types of names and so forth. But I grew up around folks that were activists that took issue with the idea of Haitians being labeled as AIDS carriers. So I remember being very young, going down to the Brooklyn Bridge and shutting down the Brooklyn Bridge to say no, that Haitians were not responsible um, for AIDS. So those type of stereotypes impacted me. Those biases impacted me. And as a result of which, um, I became a rebel, right? Sort of like I started fighting in school, uh, cutting class. There were certain places I couldn't go uh, because of the struggles that I confronted. So this idea of somebody being born here, still being identified as an immigrant, is something that I share. And at that age, because of that experience, it has shaped my, my view, my politics, and how I view people. And I consider myself an immigrant. Um, and I'm always amazed at how persistent immigrants are. I always think to myself, like, what would it be like if I woke up today and moved to China? 
how hard it would be to sort of like learn a new language, a new culture. So I, I have a tremendous amount of respect um, for immigrants who leave everything back home to come to a new place, a foreign place, and to cope, to learn a new language, a new culture. I, I think it says a lot about their persistence and their, and their sort of like willingness to navigate for, uh, for a better life. So I was part of this big riot that they called Haitian against American riot. And ironically enough, a lot of the sort of like uh, struggles I confronted was against, you know, black Americans um, who obviously were susceptible to the biases that they had heard in terms of Haitians being the carriers of AIDS and they themselves didn't want to contract AIDS. So they felt compelled to sort of like tell us you couldn't come to my classroom, you couldn't share the gym, you couldn't go on the court. So all those things sort of like created a tremendous amount of anxiety, panic, and, and, and fear. Um, after this riot, because um, one, one day it just kind of like blew up, right? Um, after the riot, the school that I went to, Nyack High School in, in upstate New York, outside of New York City, convened a, a mediation and brought us all together. Um, and we had a chance to sort of like talk about you know, what's causing this tension in the school and the community. And we were able to sort of like identify this sort of, these lies that have been peddled by the CDC because it just didn't know where the, the AIDS ep epidemic came from. And it was easy to blame it on poor black people, right? Um, so yeah, so, and we fought back against uh, this whole um, AIDS thing. I guess that's where I got my activism from um, over the years. So that experience really, really, really shaped me. Um, I went off to college. Um, I went to the State University of New York, out of Oswego, to play, to play soccer. Um, and I majored in international affairs, in large part because I became very fascinated with culture. I wanted to understand different cultures, different languages. Those things really sort of like whet my appetite. And I had a sort of like intellectual curiosity about the world outside of my, um, Immediate, uh, immediate culture. Um, so I'm here to say that though I was born here, I identify um, as an immigrant. Uh, my experience has shaped how I view immigration, not just in terms of my academic background, but also in terms of what I do now professionally, right? As a person who is an advocate for immigrant rights, as somebody who's pushing for policies that are equitable, for everybody, not just the marginalized, not just those that can't afford to have like lobbyists, right? So sort of like being an activist. I think those experience as an immigrant that has been picked on, that has been marginalized and so forth. And the theme that brings us here today deals with mental health, right? So sort of as an immigrant, and my colleague here, Hi, talked about sort of like, you know, him locking himself in a room, right? So. It has a psychological impact, right, on people, sort of like being an immigrant and the way you're perceived, the way you're viewed, the way you're picked on, all those things can sort of like suppress somebody's natural growth and development, right? Not wanting to sort of like go out, be withdrawn, and so forth. All these things, if we don't have the proper support network and so forth, can have a deep psychological impact on the immigrant community. So being mindful of that, being sensitive um, to others, that experience has, uh, has uh, really shaped um, who I am today. So, in conclusion, I would just say that we are all immigrants, right? I often view the world in terms of continents, right? We all know we have continents, and depending upon your race, you can trace where your ancestors come from. Right, so we're here in North America, right, historically, that'll tell us that this land was for the Native Americans. And anybody who's not Native American, by and large, is an immigrant to this country. So we are a country of, of, of immigrants, and I'm really saddened to see where we are now in terms of the immigration debate, and how some people have peddled lies, a lot of fear, um, that I deal with on a regular basis. I work for a member of Congress, and I can't tell you how many times a day that we're fielding phone calls from people that are afraid to leave their homes.
to come meet with us because they're afraid that they're going to be deported by ICE or that they're going to be, you know, uh, arrested, which creates all types of anxiety and so forth and cause people to be withdrawn, not want to partake, not want to be active in their, in their lives and society. So my name is Noah St. Louis and that's my time. Buenas noches. Uh, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given me to share my experience as an immigrant in the United States. My name is Pedro Rodriguez. When I was an adolescent, I used to have a really hard time having meaningful conversations with adults about everyday matters. And, and then my cousins would point this out to me, and, and they would scratch their head and they say, how is it possible that you can make very impassionate speeches before large crowds, and yet you cannot manage to have a really normal conversation when someone asks you, when an adult asks you, how are you doing? By the time I arrived in New York City in my mid teens, all of that shining was going away. I arrived in New York as a reluctant immigrant. You see, I was very happy back in my homeland about the stuff that I was doing there. I was organizing with other young people to take state power, to overthrow the government. You see, I come from the Dominican Republic. That's a country that occupies two-thirds of the islands of Hispaniola. The other third is occupied by Haiti, a country in which we have a share of 100 years history, but sometimes it seems like we're in two different universes. First, my father left New York, then my mother, then they came back with my younger sister, who was born in New York. Then they all left and left me behind. I was the older of five children, and I stayed behind living with an aunt, surrounded by cousins, uncles, and close relatives. And I was doing my thing. I was organizing students, and back then, students ruled the schools, we ran the streets, we were the face of defiance against the policies and practices of a semi-dictatorial, right-wing, unsighted president named Joaquin Balaguer. But apparently, and I learned this years later, my aunt was tired of the constant knocks on the door by the police and the circuit police looking for me. And unbeknown to me at the time, she had telephoned my mother and said, you better come get him, or they're going to kill him. So I was summoned to New York. So I arrived in New York as a reluctant immigrant. And to me, the United States represented everything that I was rebelling against back in the Dominican Republic. Back then, I knew about the war in Vietnam, the coup d'etat in Guatemala, and other countries. You know, back in the Dominican Republic, I was arrested once, one May Day. We the students went out to protest the political imprisonment of one Angela Davis. There's a lot about it recording. <laughs> 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 and 
And for us, Angela Davis was a political prisoner, just like many other political prisoners in the Dominican Republic at the time. Back in New York as a reluctant immigrant, I often joined the protests against the Vietnam War. Up and down the street, the students from Colombia and all the universities were march up and down, demanding that U.S. control from Vietnam. I didn't tell my family, I did that surreptitiously, because I didn't want to awaken in them the same fears they had when I was in the Dominican Republic. And to make matters worse, during that time, I had enrolled in high school to finish high school in New York. I was drafted. I got my draft notice. I went in for the interview. I went in for the physical. And I had drawn a number low enough to be shipped out for basic training and off to Vietnam. There were open conversations in the living room of my apartment in New York with family members about whether or not they were going to ship me back to the Dominican Republic, the very place they rescued me from. But the impossible happened. The peace talks in Paris worked, and the United States began to scale back its presence from Vietnam. So the selective service system stopped calling people. So we all breathed a sigh of relief when that happened. I was still a reluctant immigrant. It took me several years after living in New York City to realize something fundamental in my life. I realized I was a black man. And I understood, began to understand that life in America is defined by race. And that you cannot be ambivalent or ambiguous about that if you look like me. Actually, anybody who migrates who immigrates from Latin America to the United States, regardless of the shade of the skin, is a victim of racial discrimination. And if you try not to realize that fact of life in the United States, you're gonna have a hard time trying to be happy, trying to understand this society, and trying to find your place in it. You know, I had noticed that in my circle of friends and activities, I sort of gravitated to the activities that the black community, called the black community back then, African Americans, were organizing in New York at the time. And there was a certain level of affinity I can pass for black until I open my mouth. <laughs> and people know there's an accent there, and then people start to figure out where you're from, and, and, and so on. I understood then, you know, that May Day event. Angela Davis was not a political, political prisoner alone. She was a black woman. Within the United States, she was viewed as a symbol of the black community and a symbol of the struggles within that community for equality, for civil rights, and for self-determination. The other thing I learned that May Day had its origin in the United States. It was a struggle by American workers for the eight-hour workday in Chicago, Haymarket. They were massacred. But that began the struggle to limit the workday to eight hours. I began to learn all the things about the United States and its history and its people. And it also came to mind that, you know, those protests of those kids who marching up and down Broadway has actually worked. I began to learn that you can organize and fight back and actually win if you do the right thing here in the United States. But it's still, I had this notion that sooner or later I'm going back to my country. You see, I'm still I'm a reluctant immigrant. I want to go back. That's where I belong. If you know the story about Dominican immigrants in the United States, it's come to New York, it's now all the places, earn some money, get some savings, buy a house in the Dominican Republic, and you go back and retire, and you die. I went to college upstate New York, and then, lucky for me, 
I ended up in a place that had a baseball team, class A farm team for the New York Yankees. And I stayed for summer school most years, and baseball to Dominicans is like water. We need it. And imagine my shock and surprise to see some of the players with people I knew from my old neighborhood. And then they would look at me and they say, what are you doing here? They say, what do you mean what I'm doing here? I say, but you're supposed to be in Cuba, training to be a guerrilla fighter to go back and invade the Dominican Republic. They <laughs> say, why do you say that? It's when the government published a list of people and it's on the radio and everybody's name was saying, your name is in there, you're one of them. I was barred from going back to the Dominican Republic for most of the 1970s. The government had so-called black list of undecidables. And I was on that list. So the, the dreams of going back keeps being pushed further and further away. And at some point, you had to realize that you're beginning to set foot in the United States and you have to begin to uh, make peace with the fact that you live here, that you have to be part of the problems and solutions that people in your community are face. I moved to Philadelphia from New York about three decades ago. And I began to coalesce with other individuals with other groups and communities that felt the same way that I did. Because for me, personally, it was the only place I could go and talk about what being a black immigrant was. I could not do that, do that to Dominicans, with Dominicans. Because Dominicans do not realize that we have lived in a very racist nation. And for us, and for me to see it, even though I believe at the time that I could understand complex social issues and political issues and have conversations about them, for me the issue of race in the Dominican Republic was an issue of class because the dominant ruling class is racist by its own nature and it promotes racist policies, it promotes a racist education, it promotes an education that degrades the individual to the shade of the color of his or her skin. And this is a very seductive and very insidious policy. Let me give you an example. My fourth grade history textbook talks about time during the colonial times that at the beginning when the Spaniards uh, were about to be overwhelmed militarily by a force of Indians in the town of La Vega. And just when about the Indians were about to win militarily, the Virgin of Las Mercedes appears on a wooden cross. And the Indians run in horror for their lives. And the Spanish army prevails. Imagine to think that this is the history that people are taught, that I was taught. Imagine to try to make sense of that in your life. So you begin to doubt yourself with that. So for me to go and then have that conversation with the Dominicans is difficult because you need to then be able to realize that your identity has been shaped by somebody else and who you truly are has been denied. To find myself as a black man after moving to the United States was a revelation and it has shaped who I am. I am a reluctant immigrant no more. I have come to embrace this country, not only because I have lived for most of my adult life in the United States, but because now I understand the history and I understand my place in this society. And I have found a duty and a responsibility to speak out about who I am, what I see, and to teach new generations of immigrants and those who are born to immigrants, 
my two children, and Amelia and Daniel. A reluctant immigrant no more, with a duty to share, to teach, and to fight. Muchas gracias. Consultant, um, national race expert, um, Chad the ambassador, still take our talk back. He's somebody who's, who's very close to us and he's very close to this school, uh, but I'll let him tell that story, not myself. Um, if you want to take any pictures or if there's any pieces of the story that have really resonated, the hashtag for Twitter is Emoc Philly. Again, Emoc Philly. So if you want to uh, put any quotes or comments, um, during this portion of time on Twitter, just go to uh, the hashtag Emot Philly as your uh, hashtag. Well, first, first and foremost, let's uh, take the time to give these very resilient males of color a hand again. And I also want to take the time to commend you all because as I was sitting over there, I, I, I would agree, I think we would all agree that we all were captivated with all of these stories. And nobody paid attention to the fact that it was about numbers, right? We're really not into numbers. We would like for more people to come out here. But I was so swept away with the narratives, the narratives and the themes of resiliency, uh, reluctancy to embrace identity, perseverance, um, the challenges around identity, the challenges around speaking back, political prisoners, um, coming from places like Haiti and coming from places like the Dominican Republic. Um, just very, very powerful stories. And um, uh, before we get started, we just want to just set the framework up for what the talk back is. The talk back is an opportunity for us as DBH IDS to have a, a bunch of structured questions that are centered around mental uh, health, that are centered around health literacy, access to health, population health, and it also gives us an opportunity to figure out how we can intersect with males of color in a more advantageous way using the system of the DBH IDS um, entity. And it's also an opportunity for us to interact with you all as the audience, and so that's why we call it the talk back. And so the format is gonna be some structured questions that we have that we're gonna give to each of the panelists. We're just asking you primarily to be as brief, but be as powerful as you were in that space. And then we're gonna turn it over to the audience where we want you to ask some questions that you, you have as well. Uh, Gabe had mentioned um, the space that we're in. I graduated from Ali High um, in 1990. Um, and this is not about me, but I do want to say when you mentioned, you know, insecurities and things of that nature, I struggled right here in this high school from 1986 to 1990 with insecurities. Insecurities around skin color, my lips being big, my eyes being big, being skinny, much skinnier back then than I am now. Um, but I think one of the things that we do with Beyond Expectations and with EMOC Engaging Males of Color is we provide opportunities to get in this space and have conversations, candid conversations. Sometimes they're painful, sometimes they're conversations that are liberating. And so each of you had those type of conversations. We were really excited. As we get started, we'd be remiss if we didn't acknowledge the former Deputy Commissioner of DBH IDS, Dr. Marquita Williams. And so we'll start with the first question, and we want each panelist to answer this question. Um, you had some very compelling stories, but our first question is, if there is one thing about the refugee immigrant experience that you would want to get across to those who are U.S. native born, what would that be? Just go right down the line. So the question is, what, 
what would I want them to know? So, like I said, is that we, like I mentioned, that we, I want everyone, the small percentage, uh, percentage, to to hear our voices. But right now, we we are in trouble. But since we don't have a voice, some people don't have a voice, have a chance to speak my voice, like like me. So I want them to speak out. One person have voice, and together be great voices. And I want them to create more voices so that in order for people, small percentage, to hear us, we need to make them hear first, we need to make our voices louder. So I want them not to be scared and come together so that we let them know that we, what we really are. Thanks. So one, one thing I think would be, I think key for people who are born here who don't have an immediate immigrant experience in their families. Um, it, it's just to sort of listen to these stories of immigrants who are arriving now uh, and see how their voices can really enrich your own lives. Uh, this is a, an immense opportunity. It, it, just to give an example, in terms of my own formation, what is available to immigrants who begin to just open their eyes and say, oh my God, now I, I can meet someone who's a Muslim, I can meet somebody who's Jewish, I can meet someone who's agnostic, I can meet Protestant and Catholics. And that richness allows you to have and build some tolerance about people around you in your community. And in my opinion, it makes you a better person. So if you are native born, this is an immense opportunity. It's like being in a laboratory that can enrich your life and make who you are a thousand times better just because you have the opportunity to experience all the culture that are just right down in your backyard. Uh, I need to sh share with you people uh, related to the immigrant. I would like to tell all of you that all of us, most of us are immigrants. You come from different countries to be here. Even if you were born here, most of your parents probably came from different country. They migrated to this country to born you here. As a result, most of us are equal. Uh, the only thing that can make you better, probably, as we know in the region, except your belief. If you believe in Jesus Christ, better than other person, be better than other person. But we all are equal. So, if you migrate from different country to this country, we can think of even cultural competence. You better with different, different cultures. That alone, you can learn from different culture, adding up to your culture, that is very significant to you. And when we came to this country, we met most of the people in our, our, our environment, our communities are offered with drugs. We need to help the people. We need to help the young people. The young people are the one who will stay when we're all going to die and leave them behind us, our children. So we need to help them. We need to talk to the government to help these people to come on their feet. So most of us will learn uh, counseling for drug addiction, ADHD and ODD, I appeal to all of you for us to help these people. Thank you. Such passion. So once again, for the last two panelists to my left, the question once again is, if there is one thing about the refugee immigrant experience that you would want to get across to those who are U.S. native born, what would that be? That's a great question. Um, I don't know if I would have one thing in particular, um, but my general sense is that we live in a country of immigrants. I would remind folks of the tremendous amount of contributions that immigrants have made to this country. And whatever sector or industry, immigrants have played a role in terms of the development, the progress, the wealth of this country. Um, you know, I would challenge these people to sort of like remove immigrants from the economy in a week and you will see the impact that immigrants play. Um, if you take sectors like construction, okay, if you take sectors like infrastructure, hospitality, 
immigrants play a big role in those industries, restaurants. So these folks are here to work. These folks are here to be productive. These folks are here to play a big role in the economy. And contrary to what's being peddled in terms of immigrants being criminals, et cetera, the data does not substantiate that. You're probably wondering who I am. <laughs> uh, I'm Jose Aviles. I worked with these storytellers for about two weeks uh, on their stories. I'm a Puerto Rican, I'm first generation Puerto Rican American. Uh, and uh, yes, everything that these gentlemen said uh, is the answer to that question. Um, I also think that um, it's, it's our job to help immigrants feel like they belong. It is the country's job to do that. Uh, not because they just belong, but because they actually were um, and are the fabric of this country. Um, so it is an immigrant country. Um, and I think that we've removed ourselves from that um, in the past couple years. And uh, the rhetoric has been um, incredibly negative towards um, immigrants. Um, my family moved here from Puerto Rico uh, to work in the farms. And, uh, and that's how they contributed to this country. Um, and then they moved up to, uh, during the sort of industrial uh, sort of section or in the 70s when it was sort of industrial jobs were here in, in Philadelphia and they worked in the factories. Um, so just like Numa was just talking about, I, I believe that we are uh, the fabric of this country. Um, and the fact that we're still feeling like we don't belong um, is, uh, is very powerful in a very negative way. Um, and so I think we need to change that. So the next question is centered around how we can, as an organization, as the Department of Behavioral Health, Intellectual Disability and Services, how we can improve upon um, helping communities of, uh, of, of immigrants and refugees. I mean, we're really serious about that improvement under the leadership of Gabe Bryant, Edis, Eddie, uh, Pam, Anthony, all of us, we have meetings uh, weekly, and we're always trying to push ourselves to say, how can we get in the community? Just most recently, Eddie was talking about this whole notion of engagement. We, we prefer the word engagement because it's reciprocal. And so don't want to look at this from a deficit model, but we do know that in immigrant and refugee communities, there's a lot of high rates of depression, PTSD, there's some separation anxiety, some abandonment issues, all because we're seen as other third, third three-fifths, or second-class citizens. And so the next question for each of the panelists is, how could behavioral health human services be improved to serve your population and network? I'm going to read that again. How could behavioral health and human services be improved to serve your population and network? This is an opportunity for you to share with us what do you think needs to happen that will inform us so that we can work in tandem with you all? Not that we're the bullies, but it's like, how can we help you all? And so we'll start from Jose and then we'll go through. Uh, I think access. Um, I think more access. Um, there, is a, there are community schools now and I think we need to start earlier. Uh, we have a lot of young kids who are now migrated to the country that I think are going, I think trauma has hit our schools in a way uh, that is profound. Um, and I think we need to begin there. We need to begin um, with the children um, in our schools. And I know community schools are actually uh, becoming sort of service oriented. Um, and I think we should push further into that realm. Yeah, mental health is such an important aspect, right? Um, for far too long, we were overly concerned with the body and not paying too much attention to the head, to what's going on upstairs. And um, mental health is so, so crucial. And I can tell you, as, as a West Indian, or as a Haitian American, and our community, mental health is something that's frowned upon, right? You're viewed as being weak, you're viewed as somebody who can't handle stress, and so forth. So, debunking 
these sort of like notions, right? Because mental health is something that we all have to be mindful of. We have to be mindful of our sanity. We live in a world, we have so much stuff being thrown at us and we have to de develop mechanisms to help us cope, right? And when we come from like macho societies, right? That sort of like teach us the way to handle stress is to somehow be macho and not seek help, I think that can be problematic. So what I would say in terms of targeting um, communities of folks that come from the Caribbean and African is to be mindful of those cultures and finding out ways to sort of like engaging them and bringing them in. And there's no shame about seeking help for, for your mental um, situation because without the mental, everything else is secondary. Okay. Uh, I'm going to tell you all that like mental health challenge, mental health is a big challenge in this society. It's not a use. But what really can make us to prevent uh, all the, 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 the sickness is to educate the people, open the schools, training, you know, the youths or people who, who are going to work about these people. Because it's not a, it's not a big, it's not a, it's not a little stuff, something. It's a big thing working with somebody taking drug. And we have to minimize, tell the government to minimize the drug coming in this country. We have to, you know, tell the government to do that. I will train people how we can work with people that they can avoid this drug, you know, uh, dealing. This is very, very crucial. And uh, if we do so, have schools, training uh, facilities, people working with them, be careful and knowledge. I think we have to minimize it. Thank you. That's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I have been in and out of government for a big part of my life and the government has a big role to play in helping community uh, adapt and to avoid conflict uh, and to help with some of the baggage that immigrant communities come with them to the United States. And, and I think Hay made a really important point when he talks about I had no clue you cannot ride a bike on the sidewalk. It is a role for governmental institutions uh, to kind of explain some of those things via immigrant grassroots organizations where the, the sort of uh, norms can be disseminated. The schools per se are not doing, they don't have the resources to do that, to kind of parcel that out to different immigrant populations that they serve. But an organization like the BH could really do that, partnering with community organizations. And then Numa mentioned some of the some of the problems that you know people come with it. It's the question of uh, domestic violence or alcohol abuse in some cases uh, and understanding what is doable here and what is not with a caveat that we need to provide a space for those immigrant organizations to find their own space and their own way of organizing, coming together. I think imposing, imposing models on those communities is counterproductive, but working with them to develop the best mechanism and vehicle for them to get together and begin to uh, find their voice within Philadelphia, within the community, I think it is really an important element on how we provide that avenue, that vehicle, and those resources to those communities. Um, my answer may be different because maybe I'm young and don't understand much, but from what I knew so far is that what, if you ask what can you help is, if you ask now, you can't do anything because right now, there you can't just change people's minds just one click or just one second or months. They, deep down, they're already hating us and disgusted. You can't do anything about it. So what you can do is plant a seed because right now, this all they grow into a mind that they're already hating us. They're close-minded. They can't be open now. 
what you can do is for the next generation, like small people, education them, um, let them know what really are and educate the, those knowledge and those stereotype that they are that their parents may taught them that the wrong thing, and so they create more and more hateful to those immigrants, those people who doesn't know anything. So what you can do is taught them, grow a seed, plant a seed now, so it wouldn't, so the next generation, my son and my grandson, they wouldn't have to meet someone like who I met at this age. Thanks. You have a lot of knowledge, and so right here in the meantime, in the moment, in the now, uh, you have a lot of knowledge, so some, what you just said is very, very profound. Um, Numa touched on something, um, and he touched upon coping, and there are two ways that people cope, maladaptive or adaptive. And so one of the things that we want to ask you is, what role has your culture, and what we mean by that is traditions, lifestyle, customs, played in the maintenance of your wellness? Um, I come out of an African-American um, tradition, and so one of the artifacts of my culture is going to church. So if we could just start with you and just have each of you just briefly share what role has your culture um, helped with re regards to uh, mental health maintenance and wellness, okay? Well, my culture, because um, I mean, in my community, we have a pakoda, where like my culture and my religions, and also, my mom tried to get me not get into much English. See, she tried to get me into speaking Cambodian, Khmer, with her every day, so I wouldn't forget what I am and who I am. And also, it's played a big part of my life because it, this is who I am, and it's also gonna be a benefit for me because first I don't forget who I am, and also more like you can speak different languages, and which make you special, and you can speak for all the people who you know, don't understand English, so I can help them more and more people. Thanks. So, I, I once met the merengue singer, Johnny Ventura. Those of you who dance. And, and, I, and I told him, uh, thank you for giving me my country. And then for me, dancing and music has been really a way to uh, facilitate my coping and to kind of wrap myself in what it means the dancing and the music for who I am and to remember uh, the times that I had before I migrated to the United States. Uh, and I, I think that the communities that have the ability to kind of sort of recreate within the space of the United States part of their cultural traditions and roots are communities that will thrive uh, and do better in the long run. And, and it's not to say that you're gonna superimpose your values and your culture and your, your norms and your tradition in somebody else, but it means that there's that space that you know that your brain knows, that your soul feels, that your body can express, uh, and it becomes a part of who you are and who you share with other people. Uh, this question is so vast. Uh, in culture, what really I realized about the culture, uh, we are the one creating problems to ourselves. Uh, in America, we don't mingle with ourselves, especially in the communities. You have a house, neighbor houses, somebody they want to talk to you. But if we try to mingle ourselves, to learn from different cultures from ourselves, believe in me, we can be one who can be able to understand ourselves. Don't say this guy has accent, I cannot understand him, draw him near him, and be able to understand what he's talking about, what he's doing in his house, what he's doing in his hometown. So you learn from each other, it's the same thing from learning from each other. Let's not try to learn from each other. I can get culture, I can be valuable in society. You can get culture valuable to the society. If I don't want to mingle with you to learn your culture or to learn my culture, how are you going to be? How are you going to be in the society? It's carrying me, get gone, get this and that. That is not going to work at all, you know. So we have to help each other to mingle ourselves, to learn from each other, to learn from our uh, dialect, uh, educationally, and also to learn languages from each other. And as a result of that, we know more and more of our, ourselves. 
Yeah, just some really good feedback there. Right, I mean, I think you raise a good point. I think we tend to draw on what's familiar to us. So our culture, our norms, tradition, customs, and so forth. Um, with me, uh, coming from a West Indian culture uh, that stresses resiliency, uh, which stresses sort of like being able to be independent, finding your way, um, navigating this world. But the truth is we all need direction. Right? We all need a support system. We all need help. Um, learning how to ask for help. Right? Um, in terms of coping uh, with these issues, um, ha having a support system that recognizes that to come to a new country, to learn a new language, to establish yourself in a new place uh, requires a lot of mental gymnastics. And if you're gonna be sane, for lack of a better word, in terms of adjusting, right? That's gonna require to have folks around you that love you, that wanna see you strive, that wanna see you do well, provide um, a support network for you. Uh, similarly, uh, yeah, I would say family um, is uh, huge. Uh, in terms of coping. Um, but I also think our elders and our traditions of telling stories is what actually gets us through. It's what we did tonight, right? So I think that uh, has been uh, the uh, sort of major coping skill that I have used uh, in my life. Uh. We want to turn it over to the audience and then we'll come back with one last question for the panel. So if anyone in the audience has a question, um, our ground rules, we just ask that you stand up. If you need to uh, project, if you need the mic, feel free to come up. But we want to turn it over to the audience, questions that you may have for members of the panel. Um, and so we open the talk back up to the audience at this present time. Please stand. If you need the mic, we'll come over to you. So great question, I just want to cut you off briefly and politely. Great question, hear the passion. Um, we have, uh, we'll turn it over if anybody on the panel knows this. If not, we have some EMOC colleagues who can meet with you, um, who will give you some of that information because we want to definitely be a resource. Um, we will have one of our colleagues, maybe Gabe or Eddie, that can meet with you. Um, and we don't want you to leave. That question is very important to us. Um, anybody in the panel have any suggestions? Um, Pedro, I know you're with Human Services. We, at some point or another, I know in my life, have been in situations similar to that. Not specifically, I don't know the specific nature or your specific situation or the pain that you're going through. What I have found, uh, two things. Uh, I alone cannot change anything, even if it impacts me directly. For me, it has worked finding other people to help. And if I see there is a systemic problem, I try to organize around how do we change the systemic challenge into something that will benefit me and benefit other people in similar situations. Uh, there are many other situations that immigrants face uh, that because sometimes the culture that we come from prevent us from sharing that pain with other people who might help us. And I think we and the communities can help people push out of that so they can seek the help and assistance that they need. And that often works best when there is a collective approach to solving a systemic problem. 
when there is a group of people who feel the same, but are also willing to act together to change it. And it's trying to knock in as many doors as possible to try to find that group of individuals who will be willing to change the situation, not just for me, myself, but for other people as well. And once again, thank you for your question. We're not trying to dismiss it. We have some resources and human resources in the room. We have the Philadelphia Human Relations Commission here. We have some members from the Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. And so before the night is over with, we want to connect you with those individuals. But once again, heartfelt question. Maybe we don't have the answers, but we have some resources in this room that can point you in the right direction. Other questions from the audience? Other questions from the audience? This is an opportunity. Anything that you want to ask the panel, if you have a quick, in the moment experience as an immigrant or refugee that you want to share, we welcome that. This is a beloved community, um, and this is a safe space. Only for the purposes of the work that we do with the department. Gabe, do you know the uh, response to that? Uh, we don't usually do it with the visual live, but it will be recorded and we'll have a YouTube clip. So once it's uh, recorded and completed, we can get it out to everybody. Did you have a question that you wanted to Yeah. Yeah, feel free. Stand up. Okay, well, whatever makes you comfortable. Um, with, with respect to the, the arts and perhaps sports being uh, common out uh, amongst the immigrant community and you know, folks that are here, um, have you guys as an office or individuals reached out to the Sixers, which has one of the, I guess, the top team in NBA with the most immigrants? Um, have you reached out to some of the other sports teams and arts organizations to get individuals involved? That, that's a great question. One of the things that we did two years ago under the leadership of Gabe Bryant and Anthony McLaughlin is we did have a town hall um, with an intersectionality of the Mural Arts Project called Building Brotherhood, where the whole entire panel was centered around how basketball brings individuals together and how basketball is used as a coping mechanism for males of color and how to have that conversation, which you just provided, is a great suggestion and that could be one that we can follow up on. Any other questions from the audience before we go back to the panel? Has to be some more questions emerging. Yes. Over here. So I have a question. Uh, I am a program manager for Youth Move Philadelphia. It's a, like a, a youth mental health awareness program um, with the Department of Behavioral Health. Uh, and so a lot of my students um, interact with other other students, other youth throughout the city. Um, and sometimes word gets back to me about situations they're in where uh, there's kind of like um, a youth who who's from a refu refugee family or an immigrant family, and they're not coping well with kind of like traditions um, that their, their family has um, versus kind of like the, the culture and lifestyle of like, you know, now being in like the States um, or the, the US. Uh, how do you guys suggest someone who's on like the outside of your culture, outside of your, your families, kind of like, um, like weigh in, maybe express their concern or be a support to either a young person who's kind of like a young person or an older individual who's struggling with kind of like older family tradition um, and cultural tradition versus uh, what's, what we know to be is kind of like, you know, the, the various social structures in, in, in the U.S. So the, so the question is in terms of uh, how are they navigating their culture versus American culture? There, there's navigating and then there's possibly choosing to like not follow um, kind of like a traditional culture because it may not fit in with kind of like what it is they want for themselves, what it, what it is they see for themselves, but they kind of fear stepping away from that or trying something new. Um, that's a great question actually. I, I know myself growing up, um, and uh, realizing that I was very different in the scheme of the system um, uh, and growing up in North Philadelphia. And uh, I remembered actually um, sort of trying to uh, remove my culture and identity so that I can fit in. 
Um, and I remember that distinctly because it happened through my teens, because that's primarily where it all happens. Uh, I even found even my nephew, who is now just about 21, but I remember him actually going through the same exact thing completely three generations later. Um, and, uh, you know, him sort of denying the fact that he was Puerto Rican and, uh, and uh, telling everyone that he was Italian, actually. Um, so to deny his, uh, his culture. Um, it's interesting because I think it's about embracing uh, different cultures. It's what we've kind of been talking about. Um, we, it's, uh, because we're not embracing them, because we're not um, uh, having these conversations with our youth, um, they tend to uh, want to sort of push away traditions, want to try to assimilate, um, and they're not realizing uh, how important it is to hold on to that. It is what makes them who they are, um, and it is key to probably what, where their success is going to lie. Um, and I think it needs to come from, uh, I, th I think the arts is a really good way to sort of have these students, have these young people actually be able to talk to each other and engage with each other um, and put these sort of traditions in a positive way um, so that they can share it with each other. Uh, I work in the theater um, and in the theater we, uh, we see this quite often. Um, and because we have uh, each of these students sort of share with each other uh, what their cultures are, uh, and then um, sort of use it as a communicative skill, um, it has helped some of the students that we've worked with. Now, I'm not sure if, uh, but you still have to get them to that place in order for that to happen. Um, so it's really about, I, I still go back to access and opening it up uh, to these students and opening up these programs um, that are out there. What program are you from again? Uh, Youth Move Philadelphia. Youth Move. Um, and what type of programs do you, uh, do you offer the, the students? So youth leadership development training. Uh, we also do like uh, other awareness projects in the city, uh, which could include mental health or it could include like work with the police academy, uh, it could include youth town halls, um, it, could, it could include just like actually talking about like really like tough issues. Maybe if I can use an example, maybe there was like a recent shooting in a particular neighborhood or section of the city or uprising in like uh, police interactions. Um, our young people wouldn't so much respond to it, but we'd reach out to other youth organizations in the area and actually facilitate conversations on that stuff. Yeah, uh, I think the work that you're doing is in incredibly important. That is what um, what I think those kids those kids need. Um, um, I think there's two things going on here. I think that the question of assimilation, and I think that the question of duality, right? Yeah. So I think very often young people who find themselves in this country um, are struggling in terms of the broader society, right? In terms of being accepted in terms of being a part of, right, in terms of fitting in, and also the parents at home wanting the child to retain their culture, their heritage, their identity, and going through, going through great length in order to make sure that the kids don't forget who they are. And the kids sort of like, they're here in America, they want to be a part of, they want to be accepted. So I think there is that duality going on in terms of youth and young people finding themselves in American society, right, you know, speaking English fluently and so forth, making sure they don't have an accent like Pedro and I. Um, but also at the same token, um, the home aspect, right? Mom and dad or, or grandma wanting to make sure that they retain who they are in, in terms of their identity. I see it all the time. Um, when I go back home or go visit my parents in New York and we go to Brooklyn and so forth and, you know, I hear my West Indian, you know, elders, screaming and yelling at, um, you know, the youngsters saying, hey, you know, they think they're black American. They don't want to sing reggae no more. They want to rap. So I think, you know, those kind of things happen. It's the duality aspect of it. And I think a well-rounded person, you know, with maturity comes to realize that in terms of one, the importance of sort of like, you know, 
you know, assimilating, right? Understand how to navigate, understand your role in the society, but also not forgetting who you are in terms of your your heritage. I mean, Du, du Bois talks a little bit about that sort of like, you know, the duality piece from a different perspective in terms of you, as a black man, you know, when you're in your when you're in your community, but also when you go to the broader society, right? A, 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 a majority of white country, how do you sort of like act and behave and what have you? So with those themes of Americanization, acculturation, and assimilation, all of us on the panel are young at heart. But let's go to the actual young person. If you can answer this question, and then we'll turn it over, because I see two eager hands in the audience, and I love the energy of both of you raising your hands. And then, ma'am, I'm coming to you. Even though you didn't raise your hand, I saw you nodding your head in confirmation. So I'm going to come to you, and you're going to ask a question, or a comment, or whatever you need to say. And if you don't, I'm going to come over there and give you a polite high five. <laughs> Can you repeat the question again? Cool. So you can frame the question as, what would someone who's like not from your culture or maybe not from familiar with your culture, how would they support you um, and like uh, and making friends and being social um, and or choosing to be a part of a different culture? Let's say, hey, I, I don't want to follow the, the, the traditions. Uh, anymore, or hey, I do want to follow traditions more. How do I introduce my friends to this um, type oh. of thing? So, well, that's interesting because I, um, a school that I went in is um, multicultural. So, um, we share um, in class, um, teachers, um, they uh, accepting us and they, um, you know, have open minded and they have an open mind that they accept more multicultural and we share them and we have an events that we um, perform in so perform different culture and we have an events that have different food and we have even new years like we have different new years we celebrate them so that everyone can join but not when the for example Cambodian New Year we do not just a uh, Cambodian just go join but everyone um, every teacher come and we talk and we introduce ourselves and we talk about uh, what was it like and what is it and we um, inform them to know uh, what part of culture and that's the same to every culture in the school that's how we um, share our culture together and we learn from each other uh, that way. We had two uh That's a great question. Um, just from a personal experience, I had studied English grammar before I arrived in New York. I knew the structure of the language a little bit. Uh, what really kind of pushed me to the challenge was to lose that shyness that I talked about at the beginning that I, I, I had it when I was an adolescent, but I lost it by the time I got to New York, and that really helped me to, to really not be embarrassed by speaking in public or with other people. And I knew that I was going to make mistakes. I still make mistakes today. I, incorrect use of prepositions. It's a learning disability. I have it. Uh, so to me, it's like it's in the table or on the table. But I don't care. I just go out and, and, and do it. Here in Philadelphia, I think there are several organizations that provide good English language training. Uh, Nationality Service Center is one. My favorite because I taught language acquisition for about 18 years in Philadelphia after my regular day job. Um, and the best one is International House. It has, it's very, 
very uh, uh, inexpensive, but they teach language the way that the brain learns language. That is, they don't teach the grammar, they teach the conversation, and then they teach the grammar at the back end. That's the best way, best way to acquire language. I don't know, um, maybe your brother is older than I was even exist. Um, but what, <laughs> yes. But I like, I've been um, studying English no more than three years ago and um, what I would recommend you would be kind of ridiculous because I'm young. But my teacher used to um, give me this trick that you put a bunch of subject in a box and don't go anywhere, just go in your room in front of a mirror. One day, pick one of them and speak about it for like 15 minutes in front to yourself every day. And that's how I survived high school. We have one more question. You had a question? Okay. I thought you had a question or a comment. Why don't you go, then we go to her. Yeah, we want to go to her. Yes. Stand up for us. Thank you. Bandits. I was shaking my head a lot with regard to how the you know, government is going to be accepted by their peers, be accepted by the peers of the community. I was there as I was growing up. When I came here to the mainland, I didn't know much. You hear me speak English now? That was boring. Okay. They're still kids mentally, and they want to be adults. And it's hard to get accepted into their worlds. And it's a learning lesson for all of us still in this world. Even as old as we all are, it's still a learning lesson. Because every day I have something new, and I appreciate it. And this has taught me a lot, too. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you. And we're glad to have you here. And we've learned a lot from you. And thank you for taking the courage of standing up and sharing your shared experience. Knowledge is of no use if you keep it to yourself. So I'm still going to get that high five. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I am so blessed to be here today because I have learned a lot. Um, my own thing here, my culture, I was raised uh, as a Christian. I came up from a, a Christian home. And finally, I had to uh, uh, go over to my husband's uh, religion, the Muslim. And back home, we respect elders. We don't even call people by their names. So when I come to, came to America, that was my first uh, thing that I was struggling with. If somebody I'm um, older than, you just come and say, Gladys, oh, I was so offended. Even at my job, I was so offended. And then uh, the thing I'm still, that made me to, to stand here and talk, I'm still struggling with is back home uh, in my country, it's, it's, it's a no-no for you not to know your, your neighbor or to rub skin with your neighbor and say hi and converse with them and visit them. Now, this is a very tough uh, 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 case on my own side. Even as I'm talking, uh, I came to, uh, I moved to Philadelphia two years ago. I'm still struggling to, to know my neighbors, to even rub skin with them. When you even make sign for, for them to know that you want to talk to them, some will make us if they are better than you. So I'm still struggling with this. I, I don't know what to do. Thank you. Anybody want to answer that? Uh, as I was telling you all, we have cultural competence. I would define how to be cultural sensitivity. In cultural competence, not everybody is competent in his own culture. And beside that, we came to the uh, cultural diversity in this country. 
So what I want you to do, if somebody is trying to distinguish he or herself from you, try to push yourself to that person. Call, encourage that person gradually. Know what he want and know what he doesn't want. So if you know what he want or what, what she want, you know, you do whatever the person wants. If you want to be cleaning, your, your own side, his outside or whatever, cleaning your own environment, do the same thing. So you can be white, white speak. But you don't want to speak to others, but you want to go speak to you speak to that person. Hi, how are you? Are you coming up? Doing it gradually, I think probably one day say, oh, this thing. But if you try to distinguish yourself, push away away, that's the way we're gonna fall apart. And I, I believe that you know you have to, you know, learn from each other from that point. Thank you. I mean, I appreciate uh, your line of questioning, because I get it. Um, I talked earlier about sort of like uh, coming up in Haiti. I did my elementary school in Haiti. So when I moved here for good at 12 years old, it was interesting, because in Haiti, if you're in a classroom and the adult comes in, let's say like the principal walked in, I don't care what you were doing, every child would have to get up. Right? As a, as a sign of respect. So I think this is what you're getting at in terms of sort of like how do you sort of like show respect. And each culture has a different way in terms of like how they, they manifest um, respect, right? Like knowing your, your neighbors is second nature. It's something that, you know, everybody, you know, it's, it's a coming upon you to know who, who your neighbors are. So I think that's part of the assimilation. It's sort of like retaining your own culture, but understand that you operate in a different society and understanding how that society um, operates, not losing who you are in terms of who you are, but accepting the society that it is a bit different than you are. And you have to cope with that and navigate with that. I wanna get back to your question in terms of your brother learning how to speak English. What I would suggest is for him to read newspapers. Right, he should read the newspaper every single day. Multiple newspapers, right? That's gonna give him a lot of confidence. His vocabulary is gonna get better, right? His self-esteem will get better. Reading a number of newspapers is a good way to learn the language, to get comfortable with um, speaking publicly. And one last question um, for the panel. We'll start with Jose, and then we're gonna end with our, our youngest panelists and, and also a um, very bright young man. All of us are just passionate and we're, we're just really optimistic about the future for you um, and all of us. Um, and that last question is, how have current political issues like DACA, the Dreamers, and ICE raids and, ex and other things impacted you or those that you love from a mental health perspective? Um, I, I want to go to your question. Organize something on your neighborhood, you know? Um, and uh, yes, yes, yes. Um, but I just, I just have that idea. Um, I, I, it's traumatic. Um, uh, it's anxiety driven. Um, it has been that uh, for the past year. Um, and I feel it in our neighborhoods and I feel it in our schools. Our kids are scared. Um, and uh, and all we can do is give them the opportunity to express themselves, give them the opportunity to voice their fears and their anxieties um, at this juncture. But it is it's tremendous, and we feel it. It's in the air. Um, I work with immigrants on a daily basis. Um, I'm constantly being contacted by um, folks that need help navigating the new immigration system. Uh, people, you talked about Muslims earlier, fighting back against the Muslim ban. Um, there's a whole host of stuff that's happening now that impacts um, immigrants. And it creates a lot of anxiety, a, a lot of panic, a lot of fear. Um, which is really, really unfortunate. I mean, a few months ago, I was at Penn, and interestingly enough, one of their top doctors was undocked. I was shocked. You had a doctor at Penn that was undocked, and which really blew my mind away, which sort of like really shattered the, the perception, right, in terms of like who's undocked. Here you had somebody who was here who was a medical doctor who was saving lives on a daily basis, but at the same time was worried whether she was gonna be deported or not, right? So I think there's a real fear factor 
um, in that, and it takes people like us to sort of like stand up and express our values in terms of wanting to be part of a beloved community, looking out for our neighbors, right? Creating a safe space for, um, for immigrants and migrants. Max. Oh, you look, you look different now. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I don't know who, who is next to me, man, wow. Uh, what really I uh, suggest for the community to do is to really help the organization, the, the, the society, or the environment of where we are. Because we are people, we have to educate the people among us. When we open the education, we learn from each other. I think we're able to understand each other. And we'll appeal to the government, to the, to the city, to open that kind of vacuum for every one of us. And while we are afraid of each other, you know, like immigrants or whatnot, we don't understand each other, let's try to create something that can able to understand each other, to mingle ourselves, to be together, so that we can able to learn from ourselves, our cultures, and so forth. Cultural diversity and cultural sensitivity is not something they say. Cultural uh, 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 diversity is the most important thing that cultural competence. Nobody is, 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 is competent in this culture. We have subcultures from, from point to point. So understanding from each other, from cultural diversity, is, is, is most important thing for learning from each other. Thank you. Uh, let me sound a dissonant note on this question. Um, I believe that we do in this struggle, the, both the immigrant community and those who support the immigrant communities, I think we do it all wrong. We, we, we confront in this particular political climate incorrectly, in my opinion. Two things. The immigrants should not be the one leading this fight. I will prefer one, that the faith community tactically leads the fight. I want to see members of all and leaders of all faith community occupying the offices of OIC in Philadelphia. I want to see those faith communities bringing back the need for social justice for our immigrants back to the congregations, to the churches, to the mosques, to the synagogues, to those places. And I want the organizing to happen that way. The other thing is, we, we have to challenge the status quo. Marching and protesting the way that we've been doing has not moved the needle at all. This time, this political climate called for drastic action. We have faced situations like this before. I didn't expect any less from someone who's running for president to say he was gonna do that. I expected the guy to do what he's doing. It's not a surprise to me. I'm not going to behave like I'm shocked about what they're doing. And I can share with you, I know that you feel the same way that I do, it's a disgrace for people who have been, who have grown up in this country to be deported to a place they have no idea what it is. And that the problems have been separated. Mothers taken away from their children, entire families being locked up. That kind of outrage, that kind of immoral acts by our government requires a different type of response that's more confrontational, more drastic, more or encompassing the aspects of how you bring this question to be resolved in a way that is satisfactory for our communities and for our immigrants. And I believe that unless we twist this around in a more direct and confrontational way, this guy in Washington is going to get away with we'll continue to separate families, send people back to places they have no idea where they are, and to continue to create havoc in our communities. Um, let, um, so the question is how the poli uh, politics affects us. How the political environment with uh, DACA, with ICE raids, you know, you know, things of that nature, how does it impact you and the people that you love? 
Um, so recently, um, some people quote said that you know they hate immigrants. Um, they don't want them uh, immigrants to be here. They send us back home, and I I don't know about you guys, but one thing that I'm worried about now is my own problem is that my brother who, because I have one brother and one sister, like I said. My sister and me come here first because we um in the age that uh, my mom can sponsor me and my sister. But my brother was over age, and then he come after us. But the problem is that now they put so much pressure on the system, and my brother is now postponed the, the system, and he would take much, much more time than me and my sister to, to in order for me, my sister, my mother, and him to be together again. So now basically we'll just be separated by the line of hate. Thanks. Oh, and thank you so much for having me. I, I just want to say I really appreciate it for me to have this opportunity. <laughs> and that would be Thank you so, so much. We're going to end the night by turning over to our coordinator, Gabriel Bryan. He's the coordinator of uh, EMOC Engage Your Males of Color. So, I want to thank uh, everybody again for coming out this evening. Um, I also want to acknowledge who did make it out here tonight, our Deputy Commissioner Roland Lamb. So he's here tonight. You can please raise your hand, Roland. Thank you for being here. We're always thankful for his support. Um, outside again, if you want to get more involved either with EMOC or with our immigrant and refugee working group, you can sign up the sign-up sheet at the table on your way out. We still also have information at the tables. Please take some on your way out. It, it may serve you or your community, uh, your network. And just again, stay engaged. You can follow us again at www.dbhids.org backslash EMOC. Or you can also just, as well, go to our Twitter page, Emot Philly, on Twitter. All right, thank you very much for, for coming out. If you need to contact me, it's uh, gabriel.brian.philly.gov. Thank you very much for coming out. Have a good, good night.